This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 105 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Karen Inglis all about how to market a children's book. Now, even if you don't write children's books, I think you are going to gain a lot from this episode. I personally uh, found talking to Karen inspiring. She made me think in a lot of different ways, made me think outside the box. Some of that was during the episode, some of it was um, after, but I think, you know, she has this way of thinking, this kind of no bullshit attitude, and she just gets the work done and it is amazing. I I loved talking to her so I really hope you enjoy this conversation. But first to last week's question which was what is your relationship with audiobooks? So I had a lot of comments on Patreon this time which was lovely. So Matt Goodall said I've tried listening to fiction audio and I just can't focus on it. I completely understand Matt. Uh, even when I'm doing mundane tasks like dishes or vacuuming, I only need the whisper of a thought to sneak in and I'm off down that rabbit hole with it. Then five minutes later, I'm having to rewind the audio because I've lost the plot. Literally, I completely understand. Matt continues to say, strangely, I listen to podcasts very happily. I think it's just the conversational nature of them, less narrative description, etc., and just dialogue. Now, I agree. I listened to Rachel Heron recently um, and on one of her episodes, she was talking about the this and um she also struggles to listen to fiction as I do but one of the things is that she has started doing is listening to books she has already read which blew my mind I never even thought to do that but um in doing that she already knows the plot so if she misses it for a second or so or whatever she can pick it back up because she's already read the book which I thought was wonderful now I mean I don't really reread books um but this is definitely one way that I would consider listening to fiction in audio. Cassie M. Newell said, yeah, I loved listening to this podcast with Gillian. This was so fun to see the, the narrator's side of the business and how best to work with a narrator. I love her indie experience side. So many golden nuggets of information. Audiobooks are an investment and certainly a great option for getting your story out in another format. Tips on what not to do. Excellent. Amy Sun said, I adore audiobooks. I listen nearly every day when I'm gardening, doing house chores, making food, walking the dogs and driving. It's my largest source of book consumption this year. I listen to fiction mostly, but will listen to non-fiction if I don't want to notate and mark up the book or to try out a book. My library is invaluable for this, thankfully. Lynn says, I'm trying audiobooks. I can sit still and listen instead of watching TV and it's a good screen break, but sometimes I start replying to messages and get distracted and stop listening. Daisy Lythe says, I love audio. It's the main way I read now. I also think uh, used to think I could only audio nonfiction, but that's actually crap. As long as I'm down with the narrator's voice, I'm good to go. It's how I've read over a hundred books a year. Fuck me, that is a lot. Okay, so this week's question is, what unusual marketing methods have you tried that have worked? So yeah, I thought um, because Karen is so good at thinking outside the box and has done lots of cool things, um, I wanted to see uh, what you guys have done. Maybe it was a bit unusual, you tried, but it worked. Um, so yeah, tell me, what unusual marketing methods have you tried that have worked? Okay, so the book recommendation this week is Keepers. It's my book. I don't normally do this. Um, I don't think I've ever recommended my own fiction. Y'all know I have a weird relationship with that. But anyway, my book, as I mentioned last week, is in a big bundle of discounted books this week. I think today is the last day of the group promo so I will talk about that in just a second um, but my book is going to continue on sale until the end of October because and drum roll please I am putting Trey on pre-order but I will talk about that more in a second so yes we have got um, a bundle of dark fantasy uh, dark fiction I should say books so we've got horror from Daniel Wilcox we've got Jenna Moresi's books on sale we've got Helen Scheurer who was um on an episode recently we've got um Katie Dunkler Duncan um who has got young adult paranormal um so there's like horror there's dark fantasy there's young adult paranormal young adult fantasy Iona Wayland, who has a dark book about monsters and grief if you guys are interested I am going to put 
the link to the book sale in the show notes. Um, their books will only be on sale for um, today, I think, as you listen to this. So um, do make sure you go and check it out today as you're listening. Um, and my book will be on sale for a little bit longer. That is the book recommendation of the week. Um, and Keepers, if you don't know, is young adult fantasy, kind of steampunk inspired. Not, I wouldn't say it was steampunk genre, but it's definitely steampunk inspired. Um, there are, it's like guilty pleasure, young adult. There are, it's all about forbidden love, um, the fate of the world, saving the world, um, enemies, um, kind of a backwards love triangle in there. Not a, not a real love triangle, but anyway, that's in there. So yeah. Okay, so where am I? Personal update. Whoa, it has been a week. I finished the audiobook. Way! I cannot tell you how relieved and pleased I am to have finished the audiobook. It was a monster undertaking. Um, I am definitely going to do a lessons learnt. Uh, so I am actually going to put that in my diary for next week. Uh, I don't know when it will get scheduled, but um, I'm going to do the work for it next week. So um, yeah, it, this is really important. I am realizing how important lessons learnt are for me in particular. I really enjoy picking out what I did well, what I didn't do so well, so that I can do better next time. Um, I've had a few questions about uh, other audiobooks. I am definitely going to do all of my non-fiction uh, in audio. However, not yet. I have learnt a big lesson that opening too many projects and having too many things on the go is not great for me. I can definitely juggle a handful and a handful keeps me going and keeps me busy but more than a handful and um, yeah not so good. So I am not going to open the next audiobook until I have finished Trey and Sirens which will be really the end of the year. I'm thinking I'll probably start the audiobook in January just because um, I would also like to spend Nano working on The Scent of Death. So yes I don't yeah that that's where we're at. I'm literally only doing it so that I can like task and finish rather than opening up 7,000 different projects and taking a year to finish any of them. Um, so that audiobook is now with The Masterer. When that comes back, hopefully this weekend, uh, it is Friday the 24th of September as I record this, so hopefully that will be back over the weekend and then I will start getting that loaded up next week. So I am super excited about that. Um, I will say, um, actually no, I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna ask my patrons instead. What else? Okay, so I had a coaching session this week uh, from Becca Symes Academy, Better Faster Academy, and had so many realizations. It is ridiculous. I can't tell you how much I love strengths. I am literally in love with strengths. It's changing my life for the better. I have obviously talked about this uh, LGBT stuff and reading sort of lesbian, bisexual, uh, young adult fiction and how much of an impact that is having on me. Like I cannot understate, uh, overstate how much of an impact that's had on me. And I've more or less decided that that is the route that I want to go now um, for my fiction. So um, I changed the scent of death. So it's two female characters. Um, Murdering Magicians is now, I'm also, I've also done a bit of work on that this week, just changing some of the characters so that that is also LGBT. Yeah, I am definitely moving in a different direction. And if anybody has any young adult specifically, so I'm not interested in adult, but young adult lesbian slash bisexual book recommendations, please send them to me. I try to collate a list of um, books to read, uh, which I will share actually, um, I'm just not quite ready to do that just yet. Um, and I got almost a hundred, but I only found one indie author um, and they haven't published anything recently. So I don't know where all the indie authors are that are writing young adult, um, lesbian and bisexual books, but um, if you know of any, uh, they don't have to be indie, they can be trad too. Uh, yeah, I would really like to add them to this list. Uh, so please, please, please do recommend uh, them to me if you have them. Yeah, that was one of the realizations is that that is the direction that I want to go in. Um, and I've brought a domain name and I've stolen an Instagram handle, not stolen, I took an Instagram handle and I've been doing some thinking around that. I'm not going to be talking about what I'm doing there just yet. Um, because I'm still thinking things through and solidifying things and working out how in the fuck's name I can actually even put this into my schedule. Um, but things are moving and slotting into place in my head. Uh, which led me to the other realization. Now, you all know that I have been working on Trey for fucking ever, and I have not been able to get the book done. And 
basically it came down to the fact that I didn't have a why to finish it anymore. I didn't have a reason to finish it other than the fact that I started it, of course. I'd sort of lost my love for the series. Now, it's not that I don't love the series. I do. I love the characters. I love the story. I love the fact that it was the first thing I ever did. But my heart is in writing LGBT stuff now. And that series is very much not LGBT. Um, And so... I was having some trouble finishing it, especially because there was meant to be another book called Beatrice. I don't think I've ever said that out loud, but the the fourth book, the final book was going to be called Beatrice and um, I'm not going to write it. Now, what I'm actually going to do is finish out the series. It's now going to be a trilogy. So I'm going to have to add probably 20k onto the end just to wrap up all of the subplots and things. But even making that decision has made me so happy. Um, I am so excited to go and finish The Scent of Death. I think I'm like over 25k into it now. I need to finish Trey. I need to get it done. I don't want to leave it unfinished. And so yeah, that is the decision. I am going to finish the book with this, sorry, finish the series with this book. And so I spent some of this morning replotting, not replotting, but just like outlining so that I've got the timeline straight. I probably need one more session on that. Um, So I will try to do that today or uh, Monday. And then next week, I have more or less cleared the decks now of a lot of stuff. I'm just finishing off a lot of things that I was doing for other people. And then I'm spending the whole of October finishing Trey. That is my only goal. I am not doing anything. I'm probably going to withdraw from social media a little bit as well, just so that I can focus. Yeah, and get it done because I have other things that I want to do. So I feel very good, very positive. Um, I am also going to put it on pre-order. I know it's massively controversial because I don't really do that. Like normally I wouldn't put things on pre-order until they were done done but um I am so utterly determined to get this done that it's already done in my brain and so the pre-order is going up so I will probably be talking about that next week big changes all for the better finally like in making that decision to end the series early um not early because it's still like the same ending it's still going to be the same ending I'm just cutting out some of the stuff like some of the subplots and things um that I you know I've probably got about 15 or 20k of book four that will just get lost so yeah anyway it's fine um in making this decision I've all of a sudden found my energy and my drive and my hunger to get it finished I'm really excited to finish this book now I um yeah I've already written um some words for it and uh, yeah I'm just excited and in love with it again because I'm getting to say goodbye um so yeah I don't know like I don't know if this is helpful information but like maybe you can see this bloody roller coaster and and I just feel like the reason I was so blocked is because deep down I knew that this wasn't what I wanted to do anymore but I couldn't give myself permission to let go and to finish it early and so I was just blocking myself with fear and bullshit and psychological fuckery and so maybe if you are blocked maybe there is a reason that you are blocked um and it's not real block it's actually that your subconscious is trying to tell you something uh because that's certainly what happened here and now I have realized that I feel free again And so yeah, I am feeling super positive this week. All right, I'm not going to talk about anything else because I think I've waffled on for long enough. (laughs) Um, In the personal update, there is a shit ton of other stuff going on, uh, but I will sprinkle that in over the next couple of episodes. All righty. Okay, sorry, Rebel of the Week this week is Paulette Stout. Paulette says, um, I so love the Rebel Author podcast. It's quickly become my weekly pleasure. Actually, it's one of my pleasures, which happens to be my rebellious act. I was raised by a single dad who completely forgot to talk to me about sexual intimacy. I entered womanhood utterly clueless about orgasms. I had no idea what one felt like or if I'd ever had one. I jumped through all kinds of medical hoops before landing with a masturbation coach. Yes, she literally walked me through the whole damn thing. I felt like a moron for not knowing but my toes have been curling ever since I I fucking love that yeah they have um my journey was both bizarre and empowering which of course meant I had to write about it and share it with the world yes I went there and I use my own name I am so in love with this story um Forcing our pearl-clutching society to embrace women's right to pleasure is my rebel act. 
what a fucking corking act that is. Um, speaking about my journey publicly, um, out and proud with my own name is scary as hell, but women deserve better. Yes, we do. We deserve lots and lots of orgasms. Uh, too many ladies are sitting on the sidelines when they should be blissful piles of mush. Yes, we should, honey. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should. There is nothing better than an orgasm. Uh, if my novel raises awareness about every uh, woman's right to fulfillment, my struggle would have been worth it. Oh, I love this story. I, I, oh, I literally like, I love everything about this story. Like one, who doesn't love a cheeky orgasm? And two, like too fucking right. Um, I'm so sorry that you came into adulthood having experienced that, but I am so deeply grateful and, gra and glad for you that um, you embraced it, you rebelled and yeah, you took yourself on that journey because that is one hell of a journey and yeah, I, I adore this rebellion. So thank you so much for sharing it with me. If you would like to be a Rebel of the Week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, big, small, or something in between. You can email your Rebel story to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com, or you can Instagram me at Sasha Black Author. Welcome to new patron Judith Mortimer. Thank you so much for joining me. I really, really appreciate you guys. And I, of course, am deeply grateful to all of my existing patrons. Thank you so much for the continued support. I can't honestly tell you guys how much I do appreciate you because I don't think there are words enough to quantify it. And I'm supposed to be a writer. If you guys would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as bonus content, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I would also like to thank new Rebel readers who, um, Helen O'Neill and Lynn Wham, who have upped their pledge to join me in the Rebel Readers group. Uh, Under the Whispering Door is now released. It's published. I'm still waiting for my bloody copy to turn up. Come on, Blackwells. But yes, so we are going to be reading that and then uh once once we have all read it we will i will be sorting out a masterclass Right, this episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life. So I'm going to play a short word from the sponsor and uh, then we will get on with the episode. Hey Rebels, we're from Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. Kobo Writing Life was built by authors for authors and our team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. One of the ways we're doing that is by giving you the chance to reach subscription readers by opting your titles into Kobo Plus. Kobo Plus is our subscription program, which offers thousands of titles in an all-you-can-read catalog to readers in select countries. It's currently available in the Netherlands, Belgium, Portugal, and Canada with plans to expand. Stay tuned for that. Authors can opt into all territories or pick and choose as they please. It's really important to us that authors retain complete control over their work, which is why we will never ever ask you to be exclusive. You can opt your books in on a per title basis and continue selling them on all other retailers. Global Plus helps get your books in front of a new audience of subscription readers who are a different audience than our typical a la carte readers and allows you to earn money on top of your a la carte sales. Authors get paid for every minute spent reading, including rereads. So opt your books in now and reach even more Kobo readers. If you want to learn more about Kobo Writing Life, check out our blog, podcast, and find us on social. You can create your free account at kobo.com slash writing life. Now back to Sasha. Happy writing. Hello, and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I am joined by Karen Inglis. Karen is a best-selling children's author of picture books, chapter books, and short middle grade novels. Her middle grade uh, time travel adventure, The Secret Lake, has been a bestseller on Amazon in the UK, USA and Canada since 2018 and has sold over 320,000 print copies in the English language and is in translation in eight languages. Karen's other titles have all sold in their thousands too. And she's also recently published a, a second edition of How to Self-Publish and Market a Children's Book, which is the topic of today's conversation. Hello and welcome. Thank you for having me, Sasha. And it's lovely to be here. 
No, thank you. So I've known Karen for a little while through Ally. Um, we've seen each other at various uh, London book fairs, which all seem very, very long ago now. Um, yes, and yeah, I was very excited when uh, your book came out because there's lots of stuff in here around schools and kind of working more in the community and with like bookstores and things that I'm just not capitalizing on at the moment so I was really excited to see um yeah all of that so would you like to tell everyone um a little bit more about you uh, I guess like your journey and how you got to where you are today uh, yes okay I mean I've got a, a background in um, business writing so you know up until uh 20 you know 10 years ago or so I was consulting to government doing plain English um, writing in the financial services area actually uh, but sort of alongside that when the boys were little I did start to write as many of us did um, some a few children's books as I was reading to, to the kids and so on and so forth and um, I sent those out to traditional publishers and uh, had to wait six weeks for the brown envelope in those days to come back through the door and uh, you know never got anywhere I, had a, I did actually to be fair I had a close shave with Eek the Runaway Alien but then then Bloomsbury said it was the they loved it but it was the wrong length for their list and, and, and a few things like that and, and everything went back in the, a, a, a box for 10 years at that stage and I just went back to my consultancy work because I thought you know the chances of getting picked up seemed to be one in a million. Uh, but then I took a sabbatical in 2010 from the consultancy work and, and pulled out those stories. And it was when I was researching online, I was looking to, to find, um, I was looking for the latest copy of the Writers and uh, Artist Yearbook, I think. And then I suddenly discovered all this stuff online about self-publishing. And uh, then I got very interested. I found Joanna Penn. Uh, I, and I just thought, actually, you know what, I'm, I'm going to forget about trying to get a traditional publisher. I've got a writing background. I've just been working on web transformation and, and big projects. I'm not scared of this. I'm going to have a go myself. And so, so that's where it all started. But of course, back in those early days, it was really difficult. There were no, we all have these wonderful tools available to us now, you know, for formatting and we've got access to freelancers and all that sort of thing. Um, uh, that wasn't available at the time, so it was very much, much a much harder slog. So I spent hours in the Create Space forums and things like that over in the states. Uh, but you know, eventually I did self-publish. The Secret Lake came out in 2011, and I remember going into my first Waterstones in Notting Hill. And I know we're going to talk a little bit. I, I expect about brand, you know, local marketing, but the book uh, was inspired by a setting in Notting Hill. So I thought, right, I'm going to go to Notting Hill Waterstones. And I thought, well, I don't have a chance in hell. Well, I phoned them first. And then because I had a web website, um, she said, oh, you know, can I, where can I find out more? I said, well, I've got this website. And she was looking at the website and said, oh, that looks interesting. Come in. So I went in with the book and I remember her holding it because I created it with um, uh, Create Space at the time. And I remember her looking at it and saying, gosh, that doesn't look self-published. Yes, we'll have some, you know. Um, and that was the beginning of my journey. Uh, and, and I had A3 boards made up that she could put in the window. So right from the get-go, I was determined to try and give the book its best chance uh, through local marketing. And then, then, you know, over time, I brought out more books and established myself locally and sort of it went from there, really. Uh, so and I write across a whole range of age groups, you know, from picture books right up to short middle grade novels, I, you know, and it, it, the stories come to me rather than me sitting down and saying, right, what can I write next, if you see what I mean? Yeah, I, I had to try not to roll my eyes. <laughs> When you when when you said she was like, oh, this doesn't look self-published. Oh, those things, they just they make my insides boil. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. But at that time, I was so glad because at that time, that was 2011. You imagine how snooty mm. the industry was about self-publishing. And actually, she was complimenting it and she ended up taking it and putting it face out in on her shelves which was brilliant actually but yeah yeah, yeah. so um just a random quick question just for listeners yeah. who may not be aware where does middle grade end and young adult start well technically I think you know they say it ends at 12 so 8 to 12 is what they call middle grade and then beyond that is is young adult I suppose um so you know that that's but of course, it's going to differ between, you know, more advanced readers or more mature 12 year olds might be moving into YA already. I don't know. Mm. I'm not an expert on the YA side of things. No, no. Uh, 
but you know it tends to be and the other thing about middle grade is it tends to be that those those readers read in print 95 percent of them read in print i don't know what percentage of ya read ebooks but i suspect it's a quite a bit higher than than uh, the number who read you know for younger kids reading yeah we are uh, so my son is has always read from a very young age way before he went to school and we've got this funny problem with him now where so he's uh rising eight so he'll be eight at the end of november and his ability to read far outweighs his emotional maturity and yes. so we've got this odd problem where he is more than capable of reading longer books but the content is yes, just yes. that little bit too old for him emotionally um yes. or, and 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 he still really enjoys picture uh, not picture books sorry books with illustrations in but yes, he wants yeah. the story so and yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's a very weird place for him to be in. and yeah, I'm just yes. waiting for him to kind of inch up to those slightly longer not so many um illustrations anymore but um, does he does he rely on the I mean for example has he read the Harry Potter books you know so or those to advance or not I um I don't own any of the Harry Potter books and I'm having great difficulty giving her my money because of her current uh, views. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, yeah. Yes, but yes. my problem is those books were so instrumental in my own childhood, pre her opinions about transgender people, yes. that I don't want to deprive my son of the stories, but I yes, also yes. don't want to support her. And because I don't have copies, I'm in this really weird position about do I, don't I? Um, I think he's probably at the point where we would both read the Harry yes. Potter books. I'll tell, I'll tell you another really good one, though, then as an alternative, if, and you've probably read them. Have you read any Philip Reeve, the Mortal Engines books? I haven't, but I think I've got the first one. I think I've got the, read first, the one. first one it's it, it's really you know it's sort of got that sort of feeling uh, you know a little bit like his dark materials there's a great story there and there's a young lead character um and so I remember my son Nick who's a, a massive reader he let, read Lord of the Rings when he was nine about five times oh my times, goodness me um, loving it yes loving it I only read Lord of the Rings when I was like 35 <laughs> because I thought I, I thought I was the only person who'd never read it and then when I finished it I said oh God, I finished that. When I spoke to loads of people, they all said, oh, God, we've never read it. It's just too big. <laughs> I got about 50 pages in and was like, fuck oh, no. this. <laughs> well, I can, assure, I, can assure, I can assure you the journey never ends. Because I remember saying to my husband, do they ever stop walking down this path? <laughs> and he kind of didn't tell me. And no, they don't. But, you know, in there, I'm glad I've read it. There is a yeah. fantastic story in there. But you, I mean, and maybe, actually, that would be good for him. Maybe he wouldn't get bored of all what, you know, everything they need as they go down this path. Yeah, I so, don't think he's know. that lord of it. I think the size would intimidate him more than anything. But yes. um, give it to him on Kindle. <laughs> yeah, no, it's because it, you. it's funny you were mentioning that. He has shown, an, I mean, I mostly read on uh, paperbacks, as you can see behind me, but I yes. do yeah. occasionally read on Kindle. And he's very interested in the fact it's technology and he can read yeah, and it's yeah. technology so I am thinking about maybe pushing some books that way um but the Hobbit what about the Hobbit that might be a good one Is yeah I'll, I'll have a look it's I'll have a look of, yeah yeah okay okay enough mm. enough tangent um okay so we're, we're going to talk about uh children's book marketing and you are an expert in that area and also the ally um are you the um advisor is it advisor is that children's your... advice yeah. yeah children's advice i mean it's a it's a term that that means that i'm available to answer questions if people are on the forum and people i'm not always in there but i get tagged if there's something that somebody else can't answer i think it's it's a little bit like all of us who are doing those those sort of voluntary roles that because I was, I was right there from the beginning I was there when Ali Ally launched at, at the London Book Fair in 2012 and so yeah no very happy to answer questions uh, in the forum. Okay so I think the biggest question most people have is that as a children's book author children don't have necessarily access to tech or where they do have access to tech it's not really where adverts are going to be shown so how do you even start to market a children's book when you're an indie author right okay so 
the, uh, the first thing I would say, and I will say this despite the fact you can now advertise on Amazon, is I would say start locally. I mean, particularly if you're just starting out. So um, go as I did. What I did when I first started out was I, I contacted my local library and I offered to do free uh, children's book readings in there. I contact, I went into my local, it turns out we've got a local bookshop that's quite strong on children. So I took in copies of the book and asked if they would consider stocking it. Um, I also then slowly started to contact schools uh, and nurseries in the area. And the library was a really good starting point because I offered to do a free event there. Um, and I created little flyers, which in those days, you know, involved me having to email back and forth to my Bosnian illustrator. Now we have fantastic things like Canva. So you can make lots of lovely local flyers that you can put on the library desk. You can go and stick them in cafes, you know, where you know parents hang out, that kind of thing. To, to just to say, you know, I've got an event coming up or you can buy my book in the local bookshop, that sort of thing. So you're supporting. So I would definitely start out that way because although it's quite small, it helps you build your confidence in terms of and to start to get your name out there gradually and slowly. Um, and it's, you know, you can do it. You, you can do it, you know, uh, and of course, also, when you're launching your book or it's an early book, if there's any local local angle to it, I would contact your press for the local press or local magazines or community magazines where you live. Have a nice picture, emphasize the local uh, aspect of the story. If it's just that you're a local author, fine. But that, you know, it just so happens with mine and it may be with other children's authors listening that some of the story ideas come to you because of a local setting. So, so it's sort of all those sorts of things to start things off. And what's important about that is it also helps you start to build reviews. And one thing I did when I first put out The Secret Lake, um, it was on Amazon. Of course, Amazon advertising didn't exist, so nobody knew it was there. But what I did say to the parents when they accepted a review copy through the library, um, I made on this note just to say, you know, um, I'd be really grateful if when you've your children have read the book, if they enjoy it, would you consider leaving a short review on Amazon? No obligation, but you know, that sort of thing. And so that was that enabled me to start getting a few very early reviews in there. Um, and um, and interestingly, I know that, that, that uh, we're not on video here, but there's a magazine where I live called Families Southwest. And I had contacted them when The Secret Lake first came out because they have a review. And I think this magazine is actually nationwide, so they might have franchises in your area. And I contacted them when The Secret Lake came out and said, because I said, you know, would your review, could I offer a review copy? And they must have said yes, and I must have sent it to them. And it did get a review from them, it appeared. And um, I just contacted them again because it's the 10 year anniversary of The Secret Lake to say, look, this book, which I have sold 300,000 copies of, you reviewed the moment, it, you know, when it first came out. And so I'm hoping they might do something on the 10 year anniversary in that. Now that's sort of jumping forward a long time, but often little things you do in the early days are things that you can build on through local events, um, uh, you know, local presence. And uh, another example is I, I, I've been to several local uh, fairs, which are not necessarily about books, but, you know, sometimes you can tie things up. And, and one of the fairs I went to, which was celebrating the 50th anniversary of the World Cup, they were staging a family football dads against kids match and had stands all around. Now, that wasn't about books, but I took a stand because Eek the runaway alien, you can see in the background there, he was, that's a story about an alien who runs away from space to earth because he loves football and the World Cup's on. And that, that was a related theme. And I actually got that alien to have on my stand to draw attention. Anyway, long story, I went along, didn't make much money. I think I sold 30 books. So I just about covered my table cost. But as a result of doing that, I subs one of the kids bought the secret lake, it turned out. I mean, I sold about 30 books, various ones. And the school, a school contacted me because she had read it and taken it to school and said, you know, this is a local author, can we have her come in? And so I then ended up having a, a paid for school visit uh, a year later or six months later and sold several hundred books. And so, so in terms of how do you market, given that, you know, kids aren't reading adverts, Definitely don't underestimate the power of your local market all around you. Use and use all those wonderful tools that we now have to support that marketing, to tell people that your book's in the bookshop. Another thing I do is those little shelf talkers. I haven't got one here, but you can create 
you know, our local bookshop has uh, they're sort of, sort of about you know a sort of a, a, a half postcard size, and and they put them on the front of the shelf. Because you've got Canva now, you can put your book cover and a few words about it and just say to them, oh, if you'd like a shelf talker to help sell the book, those sorts of things. So, so that's on the one hand, you know, talking about establishing your brand locally. Um, and of course, if you've got really tiny books, if you, you've got babies, there are things like coffee mornings, maybe offer to read your picture book at the local coffee morning and, and take a few along, get all the copies and sell them, you know, there, that sort of thing. Um, and then, oh, and another new thing, by the way, that's come out, you know, the people are much more aware of now in terms of local marketing at these little events are QR codes. I haven't started doing this yet because I've been so busy. But, you know, if you're going to advertise your book with a flyer, why not put a QR code on it, which they can zap their phone at, which everybody's much better at since COVID at doing. And it can open up a page that they can read about your book on their phone or even a sample from the book that sort of thing. Um, so, so, that, so that's that. And obviously you're there aiming at book buyers and at, at parents. Um, but then of course, you've now got a, a advertising. We'll probably come on to talk about that. That advertising side of things was much harder when I first started out because Amazon ads didn't exist, but perhaps I'll have a little pause and uh, you can yeah, see if that I, starts to answer your question. I'm gonna have to come back and like re-listen to this because there are so many things I'm like, oh my God, that's a brilliant idea. That's a fantastic <laughs> idea. I need to write that one down, like all of these things. <laughs> I'm only just like, so far, I have only pretty much done like all of the online stuff, but now we've brought a house and we are staying yeah. here and at least until he, um, my son finishes primary school and he's only going into year three so I think we've got four years left um I'm like well I might as well start to try and establish that local so I have yes, been trying yeah. to look for like school like high school lists exactly. and and you know all of these other things yes. so that's why I was like I actually can... sorry go ahead no I was just saying obviously the obvious thing I didn't mention there which which is the blindingly obvious one but you probably want to start with your local shops and it is of course schools that you know that that is the other thing is contacting your local schools yeah and again you know you could start if you're really nervous and it's your first book maybe offer to do um a session for free but in exchange that they would allow you to take books in to sell I don't think as a way of life you should be offering free um school visits because schools will then come to expect it but you know again and you can of course these days you can do virtual visits as well uh, depending on what's going on with the with the uh, with the pandemic and in well, my the, book I talk about all of that yeah yeah mm -hmm. and I will I'll ask you a little bit more about that in a second um the the yeah, sure. other reason for me looking at this local stuff is because I grew up here so not only oh, am yes. I now a local author I'm also a local author who went to school just down the road and I, you know so yes. my high yes. school's here so I'm like wow this is a prime opportunity to like contact the school and oh you absolutely know. Uh, um, yeah and I did that I went to my primary school because my parents well my mum's still alive and and still live in the house I was born in and oh, wow. uh, so I've been back to the primary school yes that was I went back several years ago I need to go back again actually but yeah oh, that's so cool. Go back to your local school. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, are there like what are the biggest differences between marketing for children's books and then marketing for non children's books? So, like YA or adult, are there any like accepted methods that work for um, indies who don't write children's books that really don't work for for you as a children's book author? Right. Well, I would I would say that it's not so much they don't work, but they don't necessarily work to drive sales. Some of these things, and and you know, one of the a couple of things that 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 jump out at me is not working terribly well, except in exceptional circumstances. Facebook ads, for example, I have found uh, it, with one exception, eat all my money. And when I speak with other children's authors, I find very few who found that Facebook ads work for them. And um, the only exception to that seems to be where there is something very, very niche. So we probably have all heard of, the, I think they're called Wonderbly now, the books where you can have your child's name in the book. So it's very a personalized version of the book. So they've done very well with their Facebook ads because it's, a, you know, it's something that parents, if they're buying a Christmas present or a birthday present or a newborn present, they can personalize that book. 
uh, and I think they've spent you know millions of dollars doing that kind of thing. Um, but what I what I have the only other time I found that it works um, has been in my case I have a new book out one well, not new it's a, a year old now but it's called the Tell Me Tree and it's about children sharing uh, it's encouraging children to open up about how they're feeling whether that's happy sad or anywhere in between and um, I suddenly thought well actually maybe this would work on Facebook because I can target I can go in and find interest groups. Uh, of teachers, which is one of the target audiences, but also pe uh, people who work in children's mental health, because mm. this is very much a book aimed at helping children open up in a very natural way. And so, what, you know, having not done any Facebook advertising for years, I actually did go in and found some groups. And I've been running an ad, which has now had over, I can't, it's had certainly over 700 shares and 1.2. 7,000 likes and loads and loads of comments. And I can see that that is driving book sales. But typically, I would say it's much harder to do Facebook advertising unless it's something very specific. Or it's possible that around Christmas or Halloween, if you've got a heavily themed book, it might work. But I would just say generally steer away from Facebook. Amazon is much more your friend there. Um, and also anything that's got a focus on ebook marketing. So BookBub ads, for example, I did experiment briefly, but you're, you're back to this issue. The main issue uh, is that most children read in print. That's your first issue. Your second issue is that the people you're targeting are not the book reader. They are the, the, the sort of in-between person. And so whereas if you're advertising a young adult or an adult book online, there's lots of scope for impulse buys, aren't there? Because, because it's you, the reader, and you think, oh, God, I like the look of that. I'll put that in my basket. And if it's an ebook, you know you can be reading it within half an hour if you really wanted to. So you've got this problem that, that the people that you're targeting through online advertising are not, not the reader, and in any event, they're going to be looking for a print book. And the other thing is, with, with children's books, um, certainly the research I've read lots points to the fact that a lot of kids books are bought based on a child's asking for it so you know they're not so much driven by by recommendations that get the, the stuff floating past in front of them unless there's lots and lots of reviews and it's, it's obviously got word of mouth recommendation so you're up against various barriers there but that said we have Amazon advertising. And I think that's a whole different proposition because with Amazon advertising, we know that anybody who's on there searching for children's books is doing so because they want to buy children's books. Whereas on Facebook or even Instagram, they're not looking to buy books. They're probably looking to, you know, read about, well, Instagram probably, just like me, looking up, you know, house, you know, shelving units or, <laughs> or, or you know, that kind of thing. Um, that said, I think those social media channels, having said that, are important for establishing your brand online. So having a presence there is important um, because, you know, people can that people will look. They'll probably look for you. But I'm not sure that's I don't have any evidence, for example, of selling high numbers of books because of posting on Instagram. Uh, and I've heard other authors who are far more prevalent on there than I am say the same thing. But I think it's nevertheless important to be on there. I mean, I'm not as prolific as I should be, or, or I don't have time to be, but I'm, I'm sort of there. But um, yeah, have I answered the question? I yeah, I think you have. And it. yeah, no, I think you have. And I think it just shows just quite how different children's book marketing is. I mean, obviously, the principles of marketing are the same for everybody, every product. But it's it's really that niche targeting that using different tactics that um, makes a difference. Tell me again, was it called the Tell Me Tree? Yes, it's called that, the Tell Me Tree. I will be ordering mm. a copy of that for my son because uh, he, he you, sorry, yeah, he he's yeah. quite um, an emotional boy and yes, he yeah. really, really, really struggled in the lockdown. So we had to do loads of extra work about emotions yes. and you know, feeling yeah, things yeah. is okay and, and all of that stuff. So I'm always looking yeah, for yeah. books on that kind of yeah. And the good thing about that is it comes with free printables, you know, so in other words, so there's some, there's some activity pages, very simple activity pages at the back where you can write down how you're feeling, you can draw a picture of how you're feeling, and you can draw a picture of who you're going to tell, whether that's your grandma, your mum, your friend, whatever. But those pages, you can, there's a link with, in the book that you can go and get more of them and print them off, because I, I just thought, well, if schools want to use it, you know, there's, 
there's multiple you know they can print off more copies and I think that's what you know which is and parents you know it's just you know and there's some fun my friend Anne who who is an amazing illustrator has also done some things so they can draw their own tell me tree showing them how they can draw it and put their friends underneath that sort of oh, thing. Oh that's awesome. Um, no it is it, it's pretty cool. Um, so what is like, yeah go on. Well I was just going to say what about newsletters is that one of those things that's sort of tied to the the to your mailing list or like do newsletters work for children's book authors again it's something I see um other children's authors I'm in groups with complaining in the same way and I'm and me thinking good I'm glad it I'm glad this is what I had thought I I I send out a newsletter to my readers probably two or three times a year I don't do one once a week and I certainly don't do one once a month and part of the reason for that I was thinking well what am I going to say in it I'm going to be sort of encouraging them to buy my book and I'm, I put myself in their shoes and thought, well, when I was a parent, I was really busy. And if somebody had kept emailing me about buying their book in subtle ways, I'm not sure I would have appreciated it. And, you know, and I, and I probably like most writers, I, I sort of don't like trying to sell anyway. So it, it's kind of a, another reason for doing it. So I have a mailing list and I use it when I've got something useful to tell them an update or, or an offer. Um, but I don't think, I mean, and because I don't write for adults and I don't see how how effective it is, and I don't know. And I don't write in a series either. And I don't bring out books several times a year. If I was bringing out new books once a month, I'm sure I would use it in that way. Um, but as a rule, it, you're back to the thing of it, your parent is busy. And if they've already got your book, you know, there's a limit to how much they want to know about how your writing day is going because they're not the reader. So there is that difference. Um, that, that said, and actually I was going to mention this on the social media thing, where you can perhaps angle things differently, including with social media, is thinking about other audiences that maybe teachers uh, or, you know, so, so if, you, if, if you've got something that a teacher might find useful and you've got a way of creating a mailing list which is asking to sign, you know, try segmenting your mailing list off your website to say, you know, sign up for readers and maybe teachers sign up here. So at least if you've got something curriculum related that you want to tell them about, or in my case, the tell me tree, you, you, you could maybe see if you can slowly build up a, a, um, a readership, which is a different cohort than just busy parents, who, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So now I have my selfish question, <laughs> which is, yes, um, yes. how can, um, selfish. Yeah. well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my yeah, show. Okay. I'm going to ask yeah. two selfish Absolutely. questions. Yes. <laughs> um, so the first part of this question is how can, or how should writers connect with schools? What kind of preparation do they need to do? Like what helps to clinch a school? Um, and, and I suppose you've already answered this bit, but is it really worth the time and effort to connect with them or try to connect yeah. with them? Okay, right. So, so first of all, um, I will say it is. It can be hard work, and it can be very disheartening. I remember the number, you know, going through. I mean, you can you can go and find who your local schools are. Obviously, pitch to the right. Find out who the name, if you can, find out who the name of the um, literacy, who, whoever it is, it's responsible for literacy in your age group and sometimes it will be you know sometimes it will be the deputy head sometimes it will be the librarian or sometimes it will be a nominated class teacher if possible get their name often you might find you can't get past the office admin you know you'll call them and they'll say oh just send it to me you know and it's kind of you know you just got to feel your way so so expect a bit of pushback sometimes it just varies um once you've got the name of of the um the, the relevant person what you want to do is just take time preparing an email, which you can use again and again and just adapt slightly uh, and just make sure that your email um, keep, is quite succinct and, and is offering to say, you know, I'm, I'm a local author and I, you know, I'd love to offer school visits. Include a few thumbnails of your books actually in the body of the email if you can, just because it'll sort of make it look less than just like a chunk of text. Keep it fairly to the point and then attach. What I do is I create uh, an overview of my books in a separate attachment, which, you know, it might be one book, it might be five. And I have a page for each book with a thumbnail at the top, um, some blurb underneath about the story and uh, which age group it's suitable for, if you see what I mean. And um, 
uh, so, I, so I do that. So I, I, I have my simple cover email offering to visit, an overview of my book blurbs, and then, then also I tend to do a summary of how I would conduct, uh, uh, you know, what, my, what would my visit con consist of. OK, so, you know, whether that's a talk with slides and Q&A and how long it would take, that sort of thing. Um, so they've got everything there quite simply. So, so you send that through and, you know, hope you'll hear back, but probably follow up with a phone call in a couple of weeks. But it is hard work in the sense that I've so often done that, didn't hear back, rang back, couldn't get through or just turned up the office administrator hadn't passed the email on or the person in question had left. And I just think it is a bit like you sit there thinking, God, this is what it must be like to be a salesperson, you know, and it's quite, and I, I remember taking it quite personally is, it's sometimes, but it was only later when I eventually did get into some of the schools that sometimes took a, until a year or two later, you just realize they're incredibly busy. They're incredibly busy. And so, so, you know, that's how it is. Now, another idea might be, and I, I had a, a couple wrote to me about this, and I, I, I put this in my book, actually. There was a couple somewhere up north who what they decided to do is they bought off the copies of their books, put together a little package in an envelope, and they drove around and they actually dropped these off at the schools for the attention of the literacy coordinator with a nice sort of cover note saying, you know, I'm a local author. If you would like, here are my books, uh, please accept them for, as a free donation for your library. And if you would like me to come and do a school visit, this is what I can do. Do you see what I mean? So there's different ways you can do it. So, you know, that's another way, not just the in-person and online way. Now, a lot of that will be a function of where you live, you know, how far it is to get to these different schools. Um, so, yeah. And, and obviously now, uh, things, it's not just physical visits, you can offer um, uh, online visits, you know, that sort of thing. And actually maybe to support yourself there, I'm just saying it's off the top of my head, if I were starting out now, you know, maybe record yourself reading a little bit from one of your books and put it on YouTube and, and make that available for them to have a look at, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, so, there's some um, brilliant, brilliant ideas there. Um, and one of the things that you sort of alluded to earlier was around like creating a curriculum activity or curriculum s schemes connected to your books. So like, what is that? How does one, how do, how do, how does one do that? <laughs> um, and is that something that you have to plan before you start your book? Or is it something you can pull out of your book once you've written it? Like, what does that actually look like? Okay, so I would not, ex I wouldn't, um, I would never plan a book around the curriculum. I don't, you know, then, then it starts to become forced unless you are doing a, some sort of non-fiction book or writing comprehension book. I would write your story and, and obviously, by the way, make sure, um, and this goes without saying, um, that your story, you know which target age group you're writing for. So in, in my book, I talk about before you self-publish, before you do anything, make sure you know the target age group because the language, the theme, the length of the book, how many pictures or not it includes, all those things sort of come out of your target age group. And, and they are there are, you know, fairly standard book lengths and you know, use of language and age of characters that, you know, are all dependent on that. Um, so make sure you've got that sorted out in advance. So hopefully you've got a, a decent story. Now in terms of re relating that to the curriculum, what I did was I just went online and went online, this was a few years ago, and downloaded the national curriculum. I mean, you know, you've got to go to the source material to know what it is that's required. And that, that was quite a lot of work. And I, I printed it off for each year group. And I've, I've actually only, because you know we're so busy, I've only created one really detailed curriculum focused um, activity, which is around the Secret Lake. I could, could do others. Uh, well, well I, don't know, I tell a lie, I did actually do one for Eek as well. But it's getting to know that. And in the case of the Secret Lake, um, I've, it, it's, it's, it's helping them paint a picture with words is what I call it. And, and doing it through giving an account, so a retelling. So one of the things I discovered in, in for the sort of slightly, I'm trying to remember what year group it is, I think it's four to six, or maybe it goes up to five or six, they have to, to be able to give an account, tell an account of something that happened. And so I structured my, um, I took a scene from The Secret Lake where they discover the time tunnel and they climb down the time tunnel. 
and um, structured something that would we would talk about them going down and then I wanted them to come up with imagine that you are Stella writing to your best friend Hannah over in Australia telling her about when you discovered the secret lake when you discovered the time tunnel and went down it and then I encouraged them to to think about the different senses what did it look like what did it feel like as she was going down don't just say she went down the tunnel I was scared what does it feel like when you're scared that that sort of thing and so but that was very much in line with looking at the curriculum and then shaping something around it um you know I could you know it, it and, and you know what you're doing in there you're trying to help children write in the way that we all know we should write which is sort of show don't tell using the senses all that kind of thing um and yeah. Yeah, to be able to give an account of something <laughs> I I always when I look back at school and English and sort of writing at school it I just like I loved my English teacher um my English teacher definitely fostered a love of story but I just yes, don't yes. feel like we're taught to write stories in the way that we would write and sell a book in in that kind of yes. way um it's so I don't know I don't know what the word is like I definitely well, lost I, a, like I I hated being forced to deconstruct so many books oh I know like it no, just I know. I oh it. yeah I um, was the same, I was the same, which is why I ended up doing French at university and not English I was fed up with being asked to deconstruct books and I'll tell you a, very, a slightly depressing story I was in a school um I don't know about five years ago and or maybe maybe a bit there four years ago and uh, I was saying to the kids, you know, why do you enjoy reading? I often do that when I go to school. I open by just sort of having a chat with the kids. And who, you know, who likes reading? Why do you like reading? And they'll say, you know, because it relaxes me. And this, and that. And this little boy puts his hand up and he asks, well, why do you enjoy reading? He said, because I can find front loaded adverbials. <laughs> and I thought, what, what's that? <laughs> And this is when, my, you know, flipping Michael Gove had come along and said, you know, all these kids have to know. And it was just bloody ridiculous. You know, these poor teachers were tearing their hair out because the kids have to all know all this, all this jargon, which is complete nonsense, you know. Yeah, Whereas yeah. when I do my, the way that lesson plan I put together for that is, there's not one bit of jargon. It's just more like, think of a time you felt scared. How did you feel? What did it feel like? Think about that and then see if you can use that in your you know in your account if you see what I mean because that makes it more exciting for the reader if you see what I mean yeah so it's couched that way rather than yeah you know. oh I've got so many things to do after talking to you I tell you <laughs> absolutely well, tell me so I, you know I mean I still haven't <laughs> finished doing half of the things I've recommended you know it's just yeah, it's so much That's, it is, is you know. there is so much <laughs> um okay yeah. what mistakes do you see in these making uh with children book marketing Okay, so one thing I've sort of talked about briefly was at the planning stage, not knowing what mark, what age group you're writing for. I have had unsolicited sent to me, uh, occasionally a children's author has written to me who I don't know and, and closed a book that, to say, oh, would you read it and review it? And, and I'm afraid I don't have time. But what, you know, when I've opened them, invariably you get two pages in and realise that th this is just completely targeted if they haven't done their research in knowing what makes a good children's book, coming back to what I was talking to uh, before, you know, there was one that was full of adult characters, which children don't want to be reading about adults having conversations with each other, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, so that's one of the things is just not not knowing your market before you start. So, so that that can be for some, I'm not saying all, but, you know, a, a small minority starting out, that's a risk. Um now, I wouldn't call this a mistake, and it's not limited to children's authors, but I do sometimes see authors focusing on the wrong thing in terms of wanting to get into bookshops. So you often see them saying, oh, I've got to bring this book out. I now need to get it into loads of bookshops. And you know, the reality is beyond your local area where you can go in and you can establish a relationship and take books in on consignment, which means on sale or return, Trying to get your book into world, you know, national bookshops is a sort of waste of time, to be honest with you, because they're not they're not going to stock it because there won't be enough demand for your book unless it becomes a bestseller. And even if they did say they would stock it, um, they're not going to they will only do so if they can give returns. And so then you're at a risk of somebody returning your book. Um, but the reality is that most of your sales um, with children's books will either be through local 
marketing, as we've talked about, or be, they'll be online as a result of Amazon advertising and wider discoverability. So, so I would just say, don't waste your time and energy thinking, how do I get my book into all these bookshops and giving high discounts through Ingram Spark, which will mean you'll be left with next to no um, profit anyway. Um, I would just probably put them at 40% with Ingram Spark and no returns. The point being that if somebody wants your book because they've read about it in a press release in another part of the country, they can still go in and order it and get it and it will, they can, the, the, the bookshop can get it in. Um, and then the only other sort of, you know, these are all sort of just by the buys really. And again, not necessarily um, just children's books is, is um, focusing social media um, efforts on promoting to other authors rather than actually what you should be doing is trying to get the attention of readers, readers being either parents or teachers or, or whatever, me mental health workers in my case. So just be aware of when you're doing your social media, rather than using lots of hashtags about children's books, children's authors, widen that reach of hashtags and think about, you know, how are you going to catch some people there who are who are not just authors, if you follow me. I mean, mm. it's, it's great, you know, and I don't tend to do that follow for follow, which I know some people do on, on Instagram. I'll do it with authors I know really well, but I just think you're, you're better building up an organic, smaller following of people who potentially are your buyers, um, if you see what I mean, mm. uh, by using hashtags relevant to, to uh, parenting or, you know, that, that kind of thing. Or if your book is on a particular topic, like aliens even, you know, it may well be by just using the hashtag aliens that you'll get the attention of somebody who loves aliens and sees, sees the, the it and says, oh, they've got a children's book. I'll get my kid that book because it's got aliens in it. So it's kind of thinking outside the box. So I wouldn't say any of these are mistakes. They're just little tweaks you can do um, uh, and, and just being imaginative with hashtags to try and widen, widen your reach, uh, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so... So the last question before I ask about rebellions, um, you are clearly a, a long term indie author, but would you ever consider traditional publishing with children's books? Would I ever consider? Well, um, I've been asked in the past, I have been asked three times, actually, well, once actually with nonfiction, which I, I said no to for obvious reasons, because uh, that was very ironic having traditionally published a book on how to self-publish <laughs> that just would have, wouldn't have worked and they, the, the lead time they wanted it done in was too way too long and I just said look by the time you've got the book out the whole world will have changed anyway so that was a non-starter and then I was looking at the royalty rates um I've been offered a, a deal by a small traditional publisher a couple of years ago but it just losing the control uh, didn't, didn't make sense and I have more recently you know had discussions with someone but the, the thing is that you know I wouldn't ever say never but it, it, it would really have to make financial sense and it, it's that whole thing of letting go control which I'm, I'm I'm a bit of a control freak which I think a lot of us indie authors are and I like the fact that I can go online at any moment and see my sales uh, and tweak and do my own advertising so so in answer to your question I wouldn't rule it out totally, but it would have to be such a good deal. It would it would be quite a tall order at the moment, put it that way. Um, but, you know, I'll never say never, but um, that's where we are. Like, but on balance, I just love being an indie. Yeah, me too. I think, you know, you get, you come in, I think a lot of people come in with the attitude of, oh, you know, maybe one day, but then, you know, once the money starts coming in and you start to build that, audience um and you uh you know you've you've established like a, a business losing that control um you know becomes very very difficult and and like it you does. say it doesn't make any financial sense even though there is you know definitely for me that ego part that would you know, I'd still yes. love the validation of it um I but know. also I don't want somebody telling me what what goes on my cover because <laughs> I probably well, go to market exactly. better <laughs> yeah well um, it, exactly and, and just also not being able to you know 
yeah, not not being able to get access to exactly. to to your figures and and really, you know and also you know a lot of deals are done in high discount volumes and things where you don't end up getting such a high royalty. You know, the highest royalties I think about seven and a half percent on the paperback. <laughs> when you compare that with what we get, yeah, know, exactly. my, my paperback royalties are around thirty percent. You know, uh, and so and and sometimes those royalty rates can come in lower if they're doing high volume discounts. So it's you know, it's got to be a hell of a deal, uh, as it were. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I think attitudes, I don't know. I, I said optimistically in my last nonfiction book, and I think I might have said at the end of this one, that down the road, I think things will come together more. And I, one day, maybe we'll get this thing where people, it'll become more equitable and, and you'll come out. Uh, you know, the day that traditional publishing deals offer a more equitable balance on terms of royalty and and everybody sort of has certain targets to meet mm. somehow that, that might work but you know at the moment it's quite difficult I would say yeah mm. okay this is the rebel author podcast so tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel okay and does it have to be book related or can it be nope. anything or it can, can be it anything be any story you, okay. you want to tell us that's a rebellion Oh, God. Okay. I've got three short ones because I, you know, you mentioned that you might be asking me something about. Have you got time for, for three short ones or do you just want one? Um, yeah, you can do three short ones. That's fine. They're very short ones. Okay. So th this first one is definitely related to, to books. And that is, you know, that I've regularly asked the National Literacy Trust if they will add my books, in particular The Secret Lake, uh, to their recommended reading list, which they send out. And you know, a, they are a charity. You know, at the end of the day, they're a reading charity. They're not a private company. And I regularly get back pushback saying they don't accept self-published books. And every year I email them again. And now what I've started doing is adding my sales count underneath... <laughs> when I sign off you know to me, oh any chance you can do it again so I kind of won't give up it's just more like okay well this year this is my sales still you know I just kind of find it I'm slightly annoyed by you know that they still haven't moved the dial on that I love um that. yeah yeah now then then going sort of slightly more off topic in my pre-author days my, my first job after university I used to teach English as a foreign language and I, I was also director of studies after a while in the school, you know, helping design some of the courses. And I always remember that I can't remember what the context was, but the, the boss, um, this is in the middle of London, I had to lay off some staff. I can't remember why, but he he basically just sacked this girl without telling her, you know, he, she just came out in tears and said, I've just, Sam just told me I'm, I haven't got a job anymore. I just thought, you can't do that. So I just went straight into his office. And I was like in my early 20s and just said, you can't, you know, I basically gave him a piece of my mind. I said, you can't just sack her, you know, again, when I look back at it, I was quite, but I felt so cross that you can just, someone's got a job one minute, they go in, they're told you just have to leave. And, and uh, I, I, you know, I think, I can't remember what happened. He either paid her four weeks wages or kept her on. I can't remember. Oh, so that was my... Yeah. I know I just thought you can't I just thought this isn't fair the thing is I it's things which are not fair that that get to me and then one other really big thing I did which is again fairness and this was nothing to do with books again uh, several years ago when we lived in another house we were going to do a loft conversion you know a lot of people do in London you put an extra bedroom in your loft and we discovered we were told well you can't because there's a new rule that says if you're going to have a fourth bedroom that means you're going to have three cars and therefore we've got this new rule coming in off through the whole of Richmond Borough that no houses will be able to do this. And I said what? And this was lodged with the, Defa the Department for Environment. It was already about to be signed off as law and I just basically went apeshit and I just said this cannot be right and so I went online. I Well I don't know how much online was. I, I basically made calls. I did all my research and I said I want census statistics which will connect numbers of cars to numbers of bedrooms I want I want to know what this policy is based on long story short it didn't have a leg to stand on and I ended up going to a planning committee evening where you had this light flashing and you could only make your case in three minutes and I had prepared this report like this thick because I put all the statistics out and I went and sat down and there were all these councillors sitting around and the, the, the local MP who was kind of on my side because I he knocked on the door and I said right if this is what I'm not happy about he said, oh, God, it doesn't look good tonight. So anyway, so, they, so you have three minutes. And um, as soon as it started ticking, I said, well, look, sorry, I can't tell you what I need to in three minutes. But here's a report which you should read. But I said, in, in short, 
the statistics don't hang up. Da -da 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 -da. Anyway, I, I basically said, there's nothing, there's this, this absolutely is not on. And long story short, the whole thing got overturned. So it, they went back to the Department for the Environment and they stopped it. And it turned out some old boy had come up with this just before retiring and nobody had thought through the consequences. So that was oh, my big rebel day. <laughs> I love it. And I also particularly love that it was against like local government as well, because that's that's where oh, my corporate yeah. heydays oh. were. <laughs> and the bureaucracy oh. in those places is unbelievable. Um, the Funniest thing was, the funniest thing was, was what, I remember this phone call, the, the clinching phone call, I was talking to someone in the library, I said, I just need this one thing, there's something I need more, and this guy, he said, oh, we've got this other report, and he started reading, and I said, no, can you just flick to the back, just tell me what the summary is, and he said, well, yeah, by 2025, houses, I think, with four bedrooms, will have 1.2 cars, we predict, and I said, oh, thank you, send me that page, because that was like less than three, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, sorry, yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for your time today. Would you like to tell everyone where they can find out more about you and your books and anything else you would like to add? Yes, yeah. Okay, so if you're, if you're writing for children, um, uh, if you selfpublishingadventures.com is my uh, blog stroke website and you can find out more about the, my book how to self-publish and market a children's book there there's also a sister publication called how to market a children's book if you think you really know the ropes on self-publishing but I would highly recommend getting the bigger book if, if you're interested and I would highly recommend getting the print book even though I make less money on it than if ironically I sell the ebook but I would get the print book because um Sasha you might uh, back me up here there's so much in there and it's just nice to have it as a reference on your desk so so that's that and then um uh, if you're a reader or if you've got children and you want to learn about more of my books then uh, go to um uh KarenInglisAuthor.com and that's where you'll find more detail about the tell me tree Sasha uh, or anyone listening if you've got children with you know who you, you're a bit worried about or you want to get them to to open up a bit uh, there's lots of background there and you can read read more about the book there and of course online yeah fantastic thank you so much for your time and I agree that the uh, how to self-publish and market a children's book is an absolute tome so yeah definitely <laughs> <laughs> definitely all the nice big index at the front though yeah 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 <laughs> Well, anyway. thank you uh, so much to all of the show's listeners as well. And of course, a big thank you to the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, as well as joining me for Silent September and uh, other poison and pros and bonus things, then you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You were listening to Karen Inglis, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Join me next week as I talk to Alex Corvo all about your second draft. It is a fantastic interview. She was a delight to talk to, and I loved her uh, book, The Big, uh, Big Revision Checklist. So we will be talking all about that next week. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review. Oh,